Hello and welcome to today's event, 10 incredible ways you can be hacked using email and how to stop the bad guys. Today's event is brought to you by Know Before and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is David Davis and I'm excited to be your moderator for today's event. Now, before we jump into it, we've got a little bit of housekeeping we need to cover. Uh, first thing I wanna talk about is, you know, we want this to be a very educational event. So in the GoToWebinar control panel there, you'll find the questions box. Make sure you use that questions box as, as much as you'd like. Um, Roger Grimes, our expert presenter today, I know I'm, I'm confident can handle any hacking or security uh, type of questions that you can throw at him. So bring, bring us your toughest questions and we'll do our best to answer them in our dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. Now, we do have a prize giveaway on today's event. It's a $300 Tango gift card. Uh, Tango gift cards never expire, and they can be um, traded in for gift cards at places like Amazon, Apple, Best Buy, restaurants, and you can also donate them to charities. So at the end of the event, I'll be announcing the prize winner of that gift card. You can find the legalese prize terms and conditions over at our website, events.actualtechmedia.com. We also have a couple of handouts I want to call your attention to. Those handouts are in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, you can just click on those and download those PDFs. Uh, they are handouts about uh, phishing uh, benchmarks, the phishing benchmarks report, and how to fortify your organization with layered security. So make sure that you check those out. Um, I also want to point out that we will be showing a couple of videos during the event. If you happen to be calling in on a phone instead of using computer audio, you won't hear any audio during one of those videos. So if you want to hear audio during that video, uh, make sure that you're using computer audio instead of calling in on your phone. And with that, it's time to introduce today's presenter. That is Mr. Roger Grimes, data-driven defense evangelist at Know Before. Roger, thanks for being on. Thanks. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for being here for uh, this cool webinar called 10 Incredible Ways You Can Be Hacked Using Email and How to Stop the Bad Guys. Uh, I'm Roger Grimes, work for Know Before. Uh, know Before is the world's largest uh, security awareness training platform. We help uh, teach people how to recognize uh, bad phishing, social engineering scenarios, and report them to management. And I'm delighted to work for Know Before. Uh, if you don't know about me, I've been doing computer security for something like 32 years. I've earned all these gray hairs. I've written 10 books on it, working on my 11th book on computer security, uh, and also over a thousand magazine articles. And I've been the InfoWorld and CSO weekly security columnist since 2005. Uh, and there's some of my books. Uh, including the last one, a data-driven defense. Although I don't think any, none of these books concentrate on email hacking since maybe one of the first ones I wrote. Uh, but a lot of people ask, well, what is a data-driven defense evangelist? And besides being a made-up uh, title that I made for myself when I joined No Before, uh, it means that I use data to help organizations put the right defenses in the right places and the right amounts against the right threat. So help to get people to concentrate on the right things. Today, we're going to be concentrating on email hacks and the incredible ways that you and your organization can be hacked involving email. Uh, and it's really only advanced and interesting attacks are going to be covered in this talk. So I'm interested in attacks where email is the primary vector, or it could, it could be the intended goal or just a method to get to the intended goal. Uh, it's something that's interesting, unusual, or very sneaky. It's not due to some unpatched software or a zero day. It can be used for the initial compromise to break in somewhere or be something uh, called a po post-exploitation compromise after they've already broken in. And it can be due to technical attacks against underlying technology or social engineering or both. But I'm not going to cover the, probably the stand, many standard types of email things like simple phishing. And even though I'm going to show you some really cool email attacks, just remember that most of the things I show you today aren't as popularly used as simple phishing. Regular phishing social engineering is responsible for 70 to 90 percent of all successful malicious data breaches. The stuff I'm going to show you today isn't nearly as pervasive as simple fishiness. So your primary concern after this talk 
is to make sure that you've got your phishing social engineering under control and then worry about some of the stuff I show you today. But the stuff I show you today is still something you need to consider, be aware of, and protect against. But I'm not going to cover phishing. I'm not going to cover, you know, malware attachments. I'm not going to cover email bombing where they send you a thousand emails to overwhelm your system. I'm not going to talk about cross-site scripting or somebody hacking your email server or somebody just trying to steal your email address, although I kind of talk a little bit about that today, or even paying somebody to hack somebody else's email. Nope, all the stuff I'm going to talk about today is this stuff. Password hash theft, uh, password spray attacks, click jacking, rogue recoveries, rogue forms, bad rules, web beacons and tracking and stuff like that. And I think you're going to find at least one thing in here you've never seen before, if not, you know, 10 things. Uh, and, and, and certainly there are some really interesting and, and in some cases kind of scary attacks. Uh, the first I'm going to start with is kind of neat, and it's going to lead into a video by Kevin Mitnick. He's going to show you how this works uh, using, uh, uh, he's going to show you a video and, and show you how he can steal your password hash simply by having you open an email. But to start with, a password hash, everyone knows that passwords, when they are stored or transmitted, are not stored or transmitted in their plain text forms anymore. Usually there, there's a hash involved. In Windows, it would be an LM Landman hash or an NT hash. These days, most of the time, it's an NT hash. If you have an Apple or Linux or a Unix system, it's usually going to be the older systems use an MD5 hash. Today, most of them use a SHA-2 hash, but they could also use bcrypt or, or SHA-1. Uh, but if an attacker gets a hold of your hashed password, then they can try to crack it, brute force in it, using dictionary tables, hash tables, or rainbow tables. There's a lot of tools like the one I'm showing on my screen right now that allows, a, you know, if someone captures your password hash, so they can try to brute force it or guess what that hash is and get it back to its plain text password. And I would say that if your password is eight characters or less, there pretty much anybody in the world can crack that password hash back to the underlying plain text password. And then people like Kevin Mitnick and nation states, I think they can go up to like 2022. Your password can be 2022 20, characters long and they can break it uh, in a relatively short amount of time. But what most people in this talk don't know, and what I'm gonna open with here is that you simply opening an email and or clicking on a link in that email can transmit your password hash to a remote hacker on the internet where they can then begin to crack your password back to its plain text equivalent. Most people don't know that, but here's kind of the setup. Victim opens an email and then they click on a link uh, or sometimes they just simply open the email. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And that link is a malformed link. And usually what it has in it is a UNC path. Uh, called UNC is used with NetBIOS. It's Universal Naming Convention. And that UNC path will start with file colon forward slash forward slash forward slash forward slashes, four forward slashes, and then point to an object on the hacker server, remote server. And then your browser will attempt to log on using an anonymous connection. The server will go, nope, I don't allow anonymous connections. You must log on when your Windows integrated log on. Most browsers are configured to allow Windows integrated logins. And it will actually send your, it will actually send an NT challenge response session to the hacker server. And they can then convert that challenge response session to your password hash and then onto your password. So it's, it's a pretty cool thing to see. The one that, uh, the demo that Kevin's getting ready to show in a couple of moments, he's using something called the Responder tool. It's a free tool you can download off the internet. His victim will simply open an email on Office 365. It will include that malformed UNC link that will point back to an object that's on his responder server. Then the email browser program will attempt to retrieve the object. Responder will tell it it has to log in. Responder will capture the NT challenge response. The uh, responder will then convert that NT challenge response session to an NT password hash that Kevin will crack back to its plain text equivalent. So with that, I'm gonna ask Dave to kind of kick out that demo, Kevin's demo, and, and just uh, sit back. It's a really neat thing to see in person. Nick, I'm Noble Forest Chief Hacking Officer, and as part of this webinar, I wanted to demonstrate a common technique that we use as penetration testers, but also the bad guys use the same technique. And this is by sending a phishing attack, not with an attachment or with an embedded uh, hyperlink for somebody to click on, but sending a phishing attack so when the victim simply opens up the email, the attacker is able to steal 
the person's password hash. And in that particular case, the attacker is usually embedding what we call a UNC link, which stands for U Universal Naming Convention. And that type of link, that's all it means is that link goes to a resource, but the user doesn't have to know what type of storage resource it is. They just are able to access the resource to get the information. So what we're able to do is embed this into an email. So when the, again, when the victim simply opens up the email, we're able to steal the victim's password hash. So let me demonstrate this for you. Over here, we have a Windows 10 uh, virtual machine. Security definitions and McAfee antivirus definitions have been updated in the last hour. And then over here, we're gonna run a tool called Responder. And what Responder is, it's a tool that abuses Microsoft's resolution protocols. If you wanna learn about how Responder works, simply Google Responder and, uh, and Password or Responder and uh, LLMNR. And you'll be able to find a lot of information of how this works under the hood. So this is actually in the cloud, in the Amazon cloud, and it's just sitting there waiting for the attacker, I mean, for the victim to open up the email. So let's go over here. We're gonna fire up Internet Explorer. We're gonna sign in to Office 365. And here we go. We're going to go into Outlook. And as you can see, we have lots of email here. So let's look at what would be an interesting email. Hey, we have an email from guess who? Roger Grimes. So it talks about some sort of NSA promotion or something, something weird. But let's take a look over here. This is the attacker system in the cloud, in the Amazon cloud in Virginia. And we have, I'm at, uh, logged into Outlook 365 here. I'm simply just gonna click on the email. I just clicked. It takes a second for Office 365 to load. And here we go. We could see that the emails from Roger Grimes at NSA.gov, which is quite interesting. And there's nothing there. There's no hyperlink to click on. There's no attachment. But if we go over to the attacker system over here in the cloud, we were able to intercept or obtain Roger, well, the victim's NTLM v2 hash. What is the NTLM v2 hash? This is a hash that's sent over the wire, over the network. And what we have, see here is it belongs to the user Kevin, and then we have a data blob here that makes up the entire hash. So what an attacker does is they take this hash, they upload it to their offline cracking rig, and simply have unlimited time to crack the password hash. So let's go ahead and try to do this. So we're gonna go ahead and highlight this. We're gonna copy it. We're gonna go over to our password cracker over here. We're gonna create a file. Here we go, we're gonna paste in the hash. Very simple. And then what I'm gonna do is just run a, a shell script that, um, that tries to crack the hash through a dictionary attack. And this is using a tool called Ocal Hashcat. On this particular Brutalis uh, cracking rig, I have eight GeForce GTX 1080 GPUs. So we get about 26, 27 million password attempts a second. So what we're doing, dictionary and dictionary uh, attacks using permutation, it's actually quite fast. So let's see how long this is gonna take. And guess what? It's already cracked the hash. So if we take a look at this, it started at 22.36.49 and ended at 22.37.18. So that's about 30 seconds, right? So if we scroll up here, we see there was a user named Kevin, right? And the password to the hash is Kevin123. So now I could log into Kevin's account, right? Now let's say the company has Citrix or an external VPN appliance, or even Exchange, and the company's not using multi-factor authentication, well, I'm gonna get in, right? So, 
how do you prevent this type of attack? Well, one thing that enterprises need to do is carefully control their firewall egress rules so they block outgoing net BIOS traffic, which is on port 445 and port 139. So that's one of the things that your IT department could do to prevent an attacker from being able to use this technique to get your users password hashes. And more importantly, you need to stop, look, and think even before you e open up an email because that email might be malicious. Pretty cool demo, huh? Uh, now, what's interesting about this, a lot of people will say, well, okay, it worked with Internet Explorer and Office 365. Does it work with other email clients? Does it, you know, will it work with different browsers or work with Apple's and, and uh, you know, Chrome and all this stuff? And the answer to all of those is yes. Now, the one difference between what Kevin did and what I've done, I've done this demo many, many times. I've had many friends do this demo using Responder. It's a really cool tool is that I, none of us have been able to get it to where you simply open the email and it fires off. Uh, all of us, when we create and craft these emails, we always have to have the end user click on something. Although that's not really, right, a really big hurdle. It's pretty easy to social engineer and fish people into clicking on a link. Uh, but in every case um, that we've ever tried, the end user not only had to open the email, but they had to click on it. And so that makes a little bit more of a hurdle that has to be uh, you know, done. Uh, and when I've asked Kevin for details of what he did in his demo, he won't give them to me. I thought we were friends and coworkers, but he won't share it. I think he's afraid that if he's got a zero day or something, I'll report it to Microsoft and they'll close the hole. And, and, and actually, he's, he's probably right. So it's probably best to keep it away from me. Uh, if you're interested in setting up, a, what I tell people, if you want to see whether your enterprise can be compromised the same way, set up your own demo. You can do it in an hour. Download Kali Linux. Uh, it's really easy to do. I, here's the, the steps you can do that you can be up and running within an hour of using Responder and testing these types of email tricks against your own environment, using your own browsers and email tools. Uh, you know, because maybe your environment, it, it won't happen, or maybe you've got the firewall enabled so that it won't pass net BIOS traffic. Uh, all I can tell you is that in every instance, in every organization I've ever tried it with, it is worked on. So, you know, in my experience, it works across uh, most things or all things I've tried it on. But I, I encourage you to create your own demo environment using Responder and giving it a shot. There's exactly how you do it. And you don't necessarily have to use Responder. If you want to, you can use another tool like NTLM Relay X, uh, once you have the victim's NT password hash, uh, you can use it with many different tools, just like this NT Relay X. This allows you to actually run uh, and log on to other people's machines within the same domain or forest. Interesting enough, this NTLM Relay X uh, Python script won't allow you to log into the, the actual user's computer, but it will usually allow you to log into every other computer within the same domain. But you can actually run, log into somebody's machine using the other user's login name and password, and then run shell code or, or put a backdoor or you know download their password hashes or whatever you want to do. So it isn't like responders, the only tool you can use. Once you have somebody's password hash, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. You can crack it to plain text password, or you can just replay it with different hacking tools to do different things in the person's environment. It's quite powerful. And it's if you did, I, I think that 99.9% .9 of the world doesn't know that I can send you an email, have you simply open it, or just click on a link, and I get your Windows password hash that I can then replay or crack to the plain text equivalent. Most people don't know that. Now, Kevin talked about the defenses are, you want to block outgoing net BIOS. And I, actually, I've got a list right here of all the ports you need to block. If you're really worried about these types of attacks, it's actually all the net BIOS ports. So it's UDP 137, 138, TCP 139, and 445. It's LMR, UDP and TCP 5535, and so on. These are all the different types of ports that if you allow it from a regular end user workstation where they can pick up email outside to the internet, that they can be compromised by using Responder or a similar tool. Uh, one of the things you may want to do is filter either inbound 
or even you know inbound links and email that contain file colon forward slash forward slash forward slash forward slash that blocks the the Microsoft uh, Office 365 Avenue. Although uh, Adobe Acrobat just announced and patched last month uh, 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 an attack where you could open up a PDF file that contained that same file colon forward slash forward slash forward slash UNC link and would bypass all of Adobe's uh, protections about automatically running outside links. And so I could send you a PDF file that had this type of, uh, you know, uh, UNC connection in it. And Adobe would not warn you that you're opening a file that had connections to external links. They've now issued a patch. So if you're fully patched on Adobe Acrobat, you're fine. Microsoft released a patch in October of 2018 that closes this hole, but it's optional. You know what optional means? Optional means no one's applying it. Uh, but if you do download it, there's the link to the advisory and to the hot fix that you can download and apply. Uh, most people don't apply it because it can break things operationally. There are many times, many times you have UNC links that you want to work. And if you use this patch, you actually have to go in the registry and define what are allowed and not allowed uh, NetBIOS connections to external networks. Uh, and people that have applied this patch without doing the necessary research to determine that have created operational problems. So anyways, that's how you fix it. We're going to go on some other neat stuff, and I'll show you a couple more, at least a couple more interesting hacks. Uh, but here's one that's kind of a, a more traditional method, uh, which is called clickjacking. And this is where an attacker, the spammer, the fisher, they send you something in an email usually, or it's in your browser, and they're asking you to click on something, and you're going to click on something else. And at the last second, they've actually, they've used JavaScript or something to kind of all of a sudden at the last second move like you you know to move what you're going to click on like you think you're going to click on a login screen but the last second they close the login screen and what you click on is some type of rogue website or malware or something like that so this click jacking it's been going on for decades most of the browsers have shut these down to stop these click jacking attempts but if you have a touch screen the bad guys now have a really cool thing and that they can actually create on your touch screen something that looks like a black, uh, like a black hair or eyelashes on your screen or a black dot. And if you go to wipe it off the screen, you're actually activating an HTTP link because those are not dust and hair. Those are objects that link back to could be malicious servers. And right now, we've only seen this used to do uh, advertising, to get people click jack to advertise. And I guess it's not click jack, it's finger jack now. <laughs> Well, that kind of sounds bad, but uh, it certainly is probably going to be picked up by the malicious people because people are, you know, are falling for it. So something to be aware of is to educate yourself and end users that that thing that looks like dust or hair in your screen may not be dust or hair. And when I just showed you that simply clicking on a link allows me to steal your Windows integrated password. So be aware of that attack. Uh, password sprays attacks, these have been around for at least two decades. Uh, a lot of times when hackers are trying to break into you, they're trying to like, let's say break into you and they'll guess at your password many, many times. Well, most companies have account lockout rules that only allow you to, you know, somebody to guess incorrectly your password, let's say three times or five times or something like that before it actually locks that account out, locks it out for a certain number of minutes, five or 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, or actually requires an administrator to reset the account to unlock it. Uh, they're called account lockout controls. Well, hackers uh, you know, don't want to set those off. So what they do is this other type of password guessing attack called a password spray attack, where they actually guess just one or two or three passwords, a small number, small enough that it doesn't, uh, kick off the lockout account issue, and but they guess it against all user accounts across your domain or across your force, as many as they know about. Uh, this is known as a, a wide, low and slow attack because it avoids kicking off account lockout and alerting. It's many, many times successful, uh, and but the hacker needs to know a lot of logon names or email addresses for it to work. And keep in mind, you can never, a hacker, you, if you have the true administrator account, RID 500 enabled, it can never be locked out. So a hacker can guess against it any number of times. 
But using these password spray attacks, what they need to do is at least get your email addresses and or log on names. And those are usually all over the internet. You know, if you've ever done a, a you know, have I been pond search or some type of dark web search or whatever, typically your organization's valid email addresses are all over the internet. Uh, here's an interesting tool that I, I kind of highlight here called the Fingerprinting Organizations with Collective Archives FOCA tool. It uses three different search engines. You basically type in the domain name of the company that you're wanting to look up content on, and it will fire off three search engines, and it'll bring back every document, an email name, and login name, and portal, and you know anything else it finds. So that's a, a tool that would be that a hacker, a tool like this that a hacker might use to learn as much as they can. But more importantly, for this particular type of attack, they're looking for email addresses and or log on names. And they're also looking for some type of portal, online portal that they can use those log on names and password spray attack against. It's very easy to do some type of Google search or Bing search and find other people's you know, online unprotected portals. You know, they find your Outlook for Web Access portal, your Office 365, or they know your company uses Gmail, or maybe in this last example, they they found your Cisco VPN connection server that they can get to. And it's really easy to do some type of Google search for that. In this example, I actually, I did this in real life. Uh, I just typed in that following uh, search string in URL looking for ADFS, that's Active Directory Federation Services. So it's often used for uh, to for different uh, domain accounts to log into different domains or other trusted domains in Forest. And I put in, and in the title, it just has to see sign in. And if you put this into Google, even today, you're going to find lots of unprotected ADFS logon portals that you can log into. And by the way, you should not do that. Uh, you shouldn't attempt to do that. Could be construed or be considered illegal if you do without permission. But uh, setting up this slide, I did it and look at the bottom of the screen. I found one for Tesla, and when I clicked on it, look what I got. <laughs> you know, I got a valid Tesla company ADFS logon portal where if I know a person's you know logon name and password for Tesla, I can then start a password guessing attack against their account. So the attacker collects as many logon names as they can. They identify one or more portals. And then they get a list, they need to have a list of a bunch of passwords to try. And what research has found out is that 75% of organizations have people with passwords on a list of a thousand passwords. And 87% of organizations have somebody that has a password on a list of 10,000 passwords. So the attacker just goes and gets uh, a, a password list they want to use. They're all over the internet. You can find literally hundreds of them. I've got some examples of them here. And they then fire that off. What they then need to use is a password spray attack tool. There's an open source one called Spray. It's a shell script. Uh, and you just type in Spray, the type of login you want to do, whether it's you know an HTTPS login or a Cisco login or whatever, the target IP address of the server that has the portal on it that you're going to guess against, the list of your uh, user names or logon names or email addresses, and then the password list. You can even tell it how many attempts it's allowed to do per lockout period before it sets out the lockout period and how many minutes the lockout period they have to wait before it resets the counter and even put in the domain name is something optional. Uh, so th again, this is something that you could go to right now on GitHub, download it, run it, and be up and running and doing password spray attacks in no time. There's an example that I ran just in a demo lab where it's finding a couple of valid credentials for me and Eric, uh, my co one of my co-evangelists. Uh, but if you don't like uh, Linux and uh, shell scripts, there's a ton of GUI tools out there on the internet that I've used many of them for years, can enable, uh, WebBrute, Brutus, uh, and different ones that do the same thing where you just get log on, you know, list of logon names, list of uh, different passwords to try. You point it to the server and you just let it go. Uh, here's two other examples I took pictures off the internet of where they're using different password spray tools. And if you look, these are so these are real attacks uh, that attackers took, and you can see that they're being highly successful. You know, it takes lots and lots of requests. It looks like in one of these requests, they got 12, over 12,000 attempts, almost 13,000 attempts. But guess what? They're you know, being successful. They got a lot of valid passwords here. Password spray attacks is most one of the most common ways 
that attackers break into organizations. So what's your defenses? First of all, try to use passwords with strong entropy. Uh, and, and usually what I like to recommend, me and Kevin like to recommend is a long password. It doesn't necessarily have to be complex, but you certainly don't want to use a password like password or something like that or convert QVERT, or 12345. You don't want to use any of the passwords that are the most common passwords in the world. You wanna use a password that's really tough for it to guess uh, at. Certainly, if you can use multi-factor authentication, that can give you a lot of protection. Although, if you wanna see how to hack around multi-factor authentication, please Bing or Google my uh, Roger Grimes' 12 ways to hack 2FA. You'll see that I can hack around MFA pretty easily. Uh, you wanna protect your online login portals with VPNs that require some type of VPN authentication like a digital certificate before they can start to attempt to do password guessing. You wanna rename the Windows administrator, the true administrator account. You wanna rename it to something else because if you rename it and the attacker doesn't know what you renamed it to, it's hard for them to password guess against it. You also, I, I think that you want to do FOCA use a tool like FOCA and search the internet and the dark web and find out how much of your company information is out there and then work to make sure that you delete it or, or, or you know, you find passwords and stuff like that, that you, you know, make sure the passwords are changed. You wanna enable account lockout so you can get some alerts if somebody is trying to do some type of password spray attack and they end up locking out accounts. And more importantly, what I wanna ask everybody today is you wanna ask your IT security people uh, or your event monitoring people, does your monitoring detect these low and wide password spray attacks? Most uh, event monitoring tools do not detect them, but you can configure them so they do detect them. Here's another interesting thing. If you're using, you know, every time uh, when you're using like general email, whether it's, you know, Microsoft, Hotmail, uh, Office 365, Gmail, you know, whatever it happens to be, Yahoo, nearly every email, every major email provider or require has a recovery method that you can say, hey, my password's not working and I want you to send me, you know, an SMS pin code to my phone or it will ask you a couple of questions, you know, these password reset questions or they'll send a recovery pin to an alternate email address that you previously defined. All I know is that almost all the recovery methods are not nearly as secure as the primary method. And hackers know this too, and they will oftentimes intentionally send your email account into recovery mode and then use that recovery mode to compromise it. And I'd like to point out that if you have password reset questions, they are terrible and evil. Any system that asks you for password reset questions and answers like, like whoever determined that your mother's maiden name was some type of secret, you know, but even when they come up with those obscure questions like, what was the name of your first grade teacher? What was the color? What's your favorite color? What was the color of your first car? Blah, blah, whatever they ask you, those are all horrible authentication methods because hackers can guess an answer. You know, if someone, you know, a lot of that information is public. And as a matter of fact, Google a couple of years ago did a great research uh project and uh, had a paper that came out of it called Secret Lies and Account Recovery Lessons from the Use of you know, These Password Reset Questions. And what they found out is that 20% of recovery questions can be guessed by a hacker on the first try. One out of five. Turns out if your favorite color car, first car was red, uh, that's pretty common <laughs> or blue, right? It's not that hard. There's not that many colors of cars. Uh, and, and I thought it was interesting is that 20, uh, sorry, 40% of the time people were unable to recall their own password reset recovery answer. <laughs> and 16% of the answers can be found in a person's public social media profile. These password reset questions are horrible authenticators and should not be used. They're so bad that Google and Microsoft don't allow them anymore, but many, many banks and financial institutes, many, many websites will not let you set up an account on their website or service unless you set up these password reset questions. Uh, if you get them, do not put the real answers in them. Put them, treat them like passwords. Like when they ask me, "What's your high school? What was your high school mascot?" You know, someone could look that up and find out that I was a go, you know a knight or something like that. You don't want to put that. You want to put something like pizza, pizza. You know, dog, dog, frog, frog, or something like that with some gobbledygook on it. You want to treat your password reset recovery questions like they're passwords. The unfortunate thing is means you have to write them down somewhere, just like you might have to a password. 
But however you do it, however you protect it, do not put in the real answers in your password reset recovery questions. And if you've got password reset recovery questions you know about today, go back and change the answers and do not put the right answers. Every time they ask me, you know, what's your mother's middle name? Dog, dog. What county were you born in? Dog, dog. What was your favorite car? Dog, dog. What was your middle school teacher's uh, name? Dog, dog. I do not put real answers in there. But there's an even easier way for hackers to get they can actually use your legitimate recovery method against you, especially SMS recovery. All they got to do is know your email address and phone number. And then what they do is the hacker sends you a SMS text to your phone number, to your phone, pretending to be your email provider, saying that there's an issue and they're going to be sending you an SMS pen reset code. So something like this, you know, we're from Google security. We've detected a rogue sign in to your good guy at Gmail account credentials. In order to determine the legitimate login, we're going to send you a verification code to your previously registered phone number from another Google support number. Please retype the sent verification code in response to this message or your account will be permanently locked. <laughs> and then the hacker forces your legitimate email account into SMS pen recovery mode. So in this example, they go to Gmail. Instead of putting in the password, they click on, I forgot my password. And then it says, well, hey, do you want me to send your password to your, you know, do you want to send your last password in? Nope. I want to try another way. And then it's then you actually Google will allow you to send it like five different ways. And they choose, oh, I want you to send an SMS reset code to my previously listed phone number. So that's what they do. And then your phone gets this legitimate, you know, Gmail, Google verification code. That is a real message from the Google SMS recovery code service but you've been told to type it back in response to the original message. And then the bad guy takes that code and logs into your account using the recovery code sent to you, takes over your account, changes the password, changes the login method. And, and most people don't even know that it occurred. The thing to remember is that whenever you're sent an SMS recovery code, you know, you usually type those back into the browser, you don't type them back into response of something sent on your phone. In no legitimate scenario are you supposed to type that pin in back in response to the SMS message. You type it back in to the browser where you're trying to log in or recover the email account. So just be aware of that. If you didn't know about this attack, you might have been able to be tricked. I know I probably would have been you know, tricked. Uh, use multi-factor authentication whenever possible to log into your email accounts. That will kind of stop this method a little bit uh, or will make it a little bit harder. But try to avoid alternate email recovery methods, especially the weak ones. Try to avoid SMS-based recovery methods, although I say good luck. I think 90% of all websites uh, that use multi-factor authentication on the internet use SMS messages as their multi-factor authentication or it's a horrible authentication method, but many times you don't have a choice. And certainly you want to minimize public hosting of phone numbers related to your recovery account methods. Now we're going to get into another cool, interesting way to hack email. Now uh, using your email, hackers have been abusing mail rules forever. And that's those rules you can create in your account that says, you know, if the message is coming from Roger, automatically throw it into the trash folder or something like that. The hacker usually has to have your email address and password to modify your email client, to put in these rogue rules and forms and things like that. Basically, they can use almost any type of automation that's in your email system. It can be used against you. Uh, and for a hacker, they like this. And this is oftentimes used in real spear phishing and malware attacks, is that when they change, when they're using rules to modify your email client, it's not usually the change in the rules. The malicious change in the rules is not detected by anti-malware. Uh, are deterred by you changing your password uh, or anything like that. You know, it's not like your IT security department normally detects it. So again, a common example, uh, we'll use Outlook in, these, in this particular example, but it works in many different email clients. For a long time, it was just they would, and this is still very popular today, is that they'll make a malicious uh, email rule. So uh, we're going to do an example where uh, an attacker breaks into your email client, they knew your login name and password, and they create a malicious rule that copies every incoming email to you to themselves. So again, they have to go into your Outlook client, they click on the new rule option, they say, they say, I want to apply a message, a rule on every message I receive, they say next, 
uh, where you know the rule is going to be applied to every message that comes in and they're going to forward it to people or email address in this case they're going to forward every email to the rogue person at rogue.com email address or whatever it might be the attacker saying oh also run this rule on every message that's already in their inbox and turn on this rule and create this rule to run on all accounts so if you have multiple email accounts that are handled by outlook this rule will appear against all of them and then but they can do so that that forwarded all emails that you get to someone else but they can also you know intercept and delete emails like maybe they're breaking into your email account and maybe or maybe they're transferring all your banking money to a russian bank and the bank is sending you an email are you sure you want to update your banking details or are you sure you want to transfer all your money to russia or hey here's your sms reset code or here's your reset code recovery message and they get it uh, they can monitor for certain keywords, like when you get emails from your bank or from some other intended uh, victim and only send those emails to the attacker. They can actually set up a triggering rule that when they send you a triggering email that has, I don't know, the word, you know, dog, dog in it, that it will format your hard drive or delete files or something like that. Uh, you know, they can even intercept incoming emails and switch out critical details in email. They could change links and outgoing emails to a phishing link. You know, anytime they can modify rules, they basically can programmatically do almost anything to your system. Uh, they can even run different applications. They can run malicious scripts uh, by using the start application rule. Although Microsoft saw this abuse so much by fishers and attackers that by default, that particular option start application is actually uh, disabled and you have to run a registry edit and restart Outlook for that option to come back out. And so uh, attackers kind of moved on to other methods, but my favorite method, and this has not been used a lot yet, but it is very interesting. Uh, but this is where they can create a custom Outlook form which starts a rogue application when a particular triggering email is received. Uh, you can modify Outlook, uh, Outlook form to do something malicious and it can do anything again that programming can do. And if you didn't know this, when you're in Outlook and you're looking at your calendar or you're looking at an email, every time you look at an email, you're looking at it in a particular Outlook form template. And that's how the, the way the email would look. That's an Outlook form. So what the attacker would need to do is go into your Outlook client. They need to add the developer tab to Outlook. You do that by going under file options, quick access toolbar, design a form and add. So you're gonna add design a form to the Outlook client toolbar. And then when you do that, you'll get this new button at the top of your screen that says design a form. And then they can go open any of the existing forms or create a new form. In this case, they can start using the message. The message form is the one that displays all your emails by default. They can say, open that form up. We want to view the code that's in that form, which by default usually isn't anything. But then they can create and install a rogue application. In this case, it's saying, hey, use, uh, use WScript, uh, which is a shell script. And I want you to run the netcat.exe. Netcat is a common hacker tool that works on Linux and Windows and Apple. But in this case, it says run netcat. They'd have to copy netcat up there run netcat, connect back to my rogue server, my bad server across the internet, across port 443, so none of the network inspection tools can see in it, and open up a reverse shell. So basically, if someone sent an email that triggered this form, then it would use netcat to open up what's called a reverse shell back on the hacker's machine that opens up a command line shell into your machine. And all they gotta do is then save it, They'll give it, they can give it any name, they can copy over the message form, or they can call it a standard index, they can call it any name, but a good hacker would name it something that doesn't you know, really stick out, let's say like standard inbox form. And then all they have to do is send a triggering email. And how do they send the triggering email? They just send a, an email, they just create the same name, in this case, you know, Outlook standard form, they create that same form name. It doesn't have to have, it, all it's got to do be, be the same as the same name. They create an email using that form, send it to the victim, and Outlook will go, oh, this email has this form. It matches my form name, and it will then run the commands that are in that maliciously modified form. Pretty cool. 
Although you may say, well, you know, Roger, you're telling me that the attacker breaks into a person's machine with a login name and password, modifies their Outlook client to have a modified form just to send a remote triggering email. Isn't that kind of crazy if they're already in there? Well, I'm glad you asked <laughs> because there is a tool that allows you to do all of that rogue forming from a remote uh, location. All you need to know is their login name and password for their email client. And you can use this open source tool. It's made by a company called SensePost called Ruler. And it allows you to create custom remote forms remotely, modifying the user's email client remotely to have, to have that rogue form. Sorry about that. Got a calendar thing going off here. <laughs> Apparently, I got a lot of things going off here. Um, and then, uh, so it allows you to remotely send commands to create a malicious form on the end user's email client, and then you can send a triggering email and fire off that remote form. And all you need is the email credentials and some mail server info, which is very, very easy to get. It's an open source tool. Uh, that you can run. Uh, and I'm going to show you a demo in just a couple of seconds of how this works. But this is how you can go watch it on YouTube. Uh, SensePost has got a couple of great demos. It's just one out of like five or six that they have using this technique. But again, they're going to use the ru ruler hacking tool that they created, open source ruler hacking tool, to create a rogue form in the victim's outlook that runs the Empire PowerShell remote shell that creates a reverse command shell back to the uh, hacker's machine. So it's pretty cool here. This is the demo. I'm going to tell David to kick it off. And uh, the, 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 de the video is kind of silent, so I'm going to be talking over it. A ruler tool that's been fired up. Uh, this is on the victim's machine. They don't have a rogue email yet. On the right-hand part of the screen, you can see uh, Microsoft's Process Explorer is showing you that it doesn't have a command shell yet. Now they're back to the, the, the hacker's machine. They're going to fire off ruler to, they're going to create a, uh, a ruler form that has the PowerShell, uh, Empire PowerShell malicious tool in that rogue form. At the bottom of the screen, they're showing you there's no connected clients to the Empire shell yet. There is the encoded binary at the top. Uh, that allows the Empire PowerShell to work. They're gonna create the remote rogue form on the victim machine. That's what they're doing here. And they're gonna, so it's gonna create the remote, the, the rogue form on the victim machine that will kick off the Empire PowerShell. You can see it's creating the email template. So it did an RDP log on to the person's machine, made a form change, and now they're gonna create a triggering email that's gonna appear in the end user's inbox that will open up a CMD command shell over in Process Explorer. You see this, here's the rogue email that's arriving. They then click it and boom, look, there's a remote command shell up there. And now they're going back to their machine on the Empire, Empire uh, PowerShell and you can see the victim's machine now has been compromised and there's a remote shell back into the victim machine. I mean, that's pretty cool, huh? All they had was a login name and password, created a remote shell, and uh, the Empire PowerShell may sometimes be protected by antivirus, but you can put anything in there and you can encrypt it. And it's really easy to get the Empire PowerShell. It's one of the most common malicious tools used today uh, and, and usually doesn't go off on antivirus. It's a pretty cool little thing. If you wanna, again, if you wanna see that demo, there's the link, download my slides and I'll, or email me at rogerg at noble4.com and I'll send you a link to these uh, demos. They're really cool. And I want to thank uh, SensePost for allowing me to borrow and display their video, their demo. But pretty cool stuff here where they're firing off and get an Empire shell that ends up a uh, person just clicks on their email. It's a fake email and that triggers a rogue form that kicks off a PowerShell that kicks off a command line prompt that the bad guy is now logged into. Pretty cool stuff. How can you defend against it? Well, use MFA whenever possible for email if you can do that and require it. Uh, although I tell people it's probably, it's good to look to see what rules and custom forms you have in your environment. Uh, the people that made Ruler made a script called Not Ruler and it will check for custom rules and forms in your environment. Microsoft, the link above there, that's a Microsoft link. So if you've got Office 365, 
uh, and Outlook and all, you can run that and it will get a list of all the email rules and forms. Now, what it brings back may or may not be malicious, but I would say to you is, do you know whether or not uh, you know, that people are running rules and or forms in your environment? And, and if so, are some of them malicious or not? At the very least, you should probably monitor your email client configuration for new rules and forms and changes. Because again, new rules is one of the most common ways that malware uh, and phishing gets around people these days. They compromise their email in some way, create a fake malicious rule or create a malicious rule, and then they have control of that person's environment for a long time. So you want to keep a lookout on it. Uh, this next one is just web beacons. This is uh, not quite as devious, uh, but just know that anytime you open up an email and you allow the graphics or objects in it to be displayed, many, many times it has some type of invisible object that tracks you that says, yes, you know, Roger opened this email. So this is, it says 40% of all email contains web beacon trackers, uh, you know, used by both legitimate vendors and bad actors, but just know if you open up an email, you allow it to display objects or connect the links, it's pretty much going to track that email to what, you know, what type of workstation opened it, what operating system they are running, what's the IP address, what was the user's name. Even if you forward that email to people, they'll get a list of everybody that was in your forwarding list. Uh, it, it really is uh, highly accurate, even been accepted in courts of law, uh, but they're called email tracking. And it, and it works by embedding uniquely named images in your email that are that are encoded with a number that's just specific for you, for your email address or identity. So when you open up your email and you display it, they pretty much know that it's you. Web beacons are often these one pixel transparent images, but it can be a hundred different emails and that email that tracks it towards you. The common link is that it's usually an HTTP or HTTPS link back somewhere else. Uh, here's an example of a legitimate email I got from Nikon because I own a Nikon camera. And if I look at the source code, when you go look for these things, you, you'll see that width equals one, height equals one. I mean, it's saying that's a graphical image that has that is one pixel big and one pixel wide or whatever. That's not really anything you're meant to see. And it's attached to that unique identifier. And that I guarantee you that unique identifier is attached to my particular email address. Uh, but here is a spam. Uh, you know, a phishing attempt that came supposedly from Apple support. Uh, but it's funny, you know, look at the email address, you know, info at Netgear or whatever. Uh, and again, it's got one of those web beacons in there. And it can't hack you beyond at least, you know, if you open this, then the attacker would know, hey, uh, you know, Roger Grimes is a valid email address. And that's somebody we can spam to death from now on. And they can certainly have more malicious attempts in there. So just uh, realize that email tracking is going on and you can block it. You can get a bunch of, uh, you can even buy your own email tracking services and you can buy anti-email tracking services. But for the most part, most of our email clients will warn you and it will give you a warning like, hey, you know, click here to download the pictures. We're trying to help protect your privacy. So, you know, we prevented the automatic download of some pictures in this picture. If you allow those pictures to be there, you're pretty much allowing web tracking to be on. And just keep that in mind. So just be aware that that's going on. And I'm running out of time. I want to get to questions. So I'll go to one of the last things here. Uh, sometimes they don't have to manipulate your client, your email client at all. All they have to do is change the DNS records that that route your email. So NDNS, uh, the MX record stands for mail exchange. Uh, hackers many times will hijack these DNS records, uh, the MX record that's in the DNS record, or even BGP. That's the uh, border gate protocol that kind of makes the internet routers route correctly. Well, if any of these can be hijacked by an attacker, it will reroute your email. You won't even know about it really because all it is is that all of a sudden you're not getting email. Uh, and then uh, the, once someone's detected, it usually takes the average company from hours to a day to resolve. And this has been in many real, real world attacks. One of my favorite here is that a strange snafu misroutes domestic U.S. Internet traffic through a Chinese telecom. Beware, China may be reading your email. And that was just back in 2000 at the end of 2018. Uh, here's where Lenovo. Uh, you know, which used to be part of IBM, and now they're Lenovo's a uh, thing, a Chinese uh, laptop company and printer company. But they had their MX record hijacked. And what's kind of cool is that in this case, uh, Russell Brandom is a media guy trying to confirm with Lenovo that they had their MX record hijacked. And it was funny, the Lizard Squad, who had hijacked it, responded back, you know, sorry, Tim, that's junk, apparently. <laughs> so <laughs> they were telling him, you know, who's saying, hey, you're all hijacked? Yeah, it turns out. Yeah, turns out pretty funny. 
Uh, and here's where uh, Snapchat, they got hijacked. Actually, one of the, you know, when they're in, when you have a big service, you use all kinds of different servers on the internet to serve up stuff. They're, those servers and the SMTP records got hijacked and uh, that information that was stolen for a while. Uh, and let me say, tens of millions of dollars have been stolen. A lot of people uh, that rely upon their email as a recovery method for their crypto wallets and stuff, uh, they get hijacked. So they're, you know, their personal uh, MX record pointing to their personal email server gets hijacked. Bad guy puts their, you know, their cryptocurrency wallet in recovery mode. That recovery email is sent to the attacker that then steals the control to the crypto wallet and it's a game over. So be careful, watch out for these DNS hijack stuff. You wanna make sure you put a registrar lock on your DNS record, which means it can't be stolen easily without notifying you first. It's good to use multi-factor authentication, require that to change DNS records. You definitely wanna get notified of any changes to email related DNS stuff. Uh, and I got some other things there, but we're getting ready to run out of time. I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. But one of the you know the key takeaways is that email has long been a common attack vectors. Uh, many of the attacks, most of the attacks that I showed you today, uh, people that, that are not they're not detected by traditional AV. And if you're not even aware of them, you can't look for them. Like you know, custom like bad malicious rules and forms. So you want to train your employees to be aware of some types of these attacks and also implement that. So. Phishing is your number one problem. Phishing is simple phishing and social engineering is responsible for 70 to 90% of all malicious email attacks. But these types of attacks also do occur, occur in the real world and you want to take you know, the appropriate defensive steps. Also I want to tell you to make sure you take a look at the knowbefore.com forward slash resources. I think we have 15 free tools now. We gain a new free tool every couple of months. Uh, lots of white papers, including my uh, 12 ways to hack 2FA is now out there. We got lots of white papers, lots of cool stuff there. Please check out noble4.com forward slash resources. Um, and one of my favorites is the password exposure test tool. That's where you can find out and see if your email passwords are already out there on the internet or the dark web. That's pretty cool. That will run it against all the accounts in your active directory domain. Pretty cool stuff. With that said, we're gonna go in. David's gonna uh, help set us up for some questions and I think announce uh, who won the uh, contest for the $300 uh, Tango card. That's right, Roger. Yeah, really great presentation. Some really scary, mind-blowing stuff. So thank you. Um, the winner of the $300 Tango card is Brian Hewn from Colorado. Congratulations, Brian. We'll reach out to you with your prize. Uh, we do have a few questions here for you from the audience. I know we don't have a lot, lot of time left, so maybe we can just take a couple. Um, Francis is asking uh, about passphrases. Uh, he's, they're saying, is horse, cow, cheese, yellow, five, eight, seven pounds still valid? And will it prevent hacks in your opinion, Roger? Well, yeah, so the longer password, the longer entropy is going to help. You know, I, I think I think if everybody went to pass phrases, the password hacking tools would just change the pass phrases and make them not quite as good. But right now, most of the password uh, hash cracking tools, rainbow tables are still cracking individual letters. And so I think it provides you a lot of defense for some attacks. I mean, there's other attack types where no matter what your password is, I can steal it. But in a lot of the attacks I showed here today, you know, especially the, the password spray attacks and the, you know, the uh, password hash theft attack at the beginning that Kevin showed, a longer, more entropy driven password and longer is better. It's going to give you protection. So, yes. OK. Uh, Christopher said that he bought your book many years ago, Hacking the Hacker. So that's uh, good feedback there. Uh, Brian is asking, uh, would the 256 bit encryption standard make it take a lot longer to crack the hash? Uh, yes and no. Uh, but in most cases, because no matter what encryption you use, if the password has weak entropy and let's say is only eight characters long, because they're guessing at it by using, you know, dictionary attacks or rainbow tables, they can still crack it relatively easy. But if you do have a longer password and use more entropy, then that would provide you you know, some additional protection against that. Uh, and uh, on Hacking the Hacker, I just learned uh, a little while ago that Hacking the Hacker is going to become an audio book. And they asked me, did I want to do the, uh, you know, the audio for it? I'm like, no, I sound like, you know, Sylvester Stallone or or uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, I said, you get somebody with a better voice. But uh, thank you for buying Hack the Hacker. It's, it's going to become an audio book. Wow. I need to check that out, actually. I'm going to be on the lookout for that audio book. Uh, let's see here. Last question we probably have time for. Um, you know, a lot of the exploits you talked about are on Windows. Is it possible to do these same types of exploits on Mac OS? 
So many of them, yeah. I mean, I can't say all of them, but I have tested them against Mac OSs and Mac email clients and stuff like that. Not all of these attacks, certainly, but most of them, uh, you know, the rule, the malicious rule attack works, uh, the uh, password hash theft, the password spray. I mean, there's lots of things that do work against all platforms, but I don't know every scenario. So what I tell people, it's always good when you see these attacks to test them, pen test them in your own environment to see what does or doesn't work. I mean, you may, you know, like for the password theft attack, you may have NetBIOS blocked in your you're fine. But if you don't have NetBIOS blocked on your uh, internet gateway firewall, or if uh, someone takes a laptop off your internet, uh, off your network and travels, that port becomes unblocked and then would work against their client. But in all cases, try before you buy or try after you buy and see if it does or doesn't work in your environment. But I would say that most of these things I showed you today work on most platforms, most browsers, most email clients. Very cool. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. But uh, really great, mind-blowing stuff, Roger. I always learn a lot when uh, you speak on these events. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Nobefore, for sponsoring today's event. For more information on Nobefore, visit their website, nobefore.com. Uh, as Roger mentioned, they have a ton of free tools, free resources uh, all around security uh, to help educate uh, your end users about security awareness, make them more secure aware. Uh, and you know, better protect your company. So thank you, Know Before, and thank you everyone out there in the audience for attending today's event. Have a great day. Take care.